So we uh, today, uh, under the request of somebody at USA, I cannot remember her name, Nichelle is her name, and she asked me to talk about acute stroke therapies. Now, um, strokes, we all should be concerned about strokes and we all should, should know about this. This is important because um, you can see from, from this uh, slide that strokes are, are very important and actually strokes is now the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. So look at this, every 40 seconds someone has stroke and every few minutes somebody dies of a stroke. So this is important and I think that community should know about stroke symptoms and what to do when someone has strokes. Strokes used to be the third leading cause of death, but for the last few years, because of care that we provide to these patients, now stroke is the fifth leading cause of death and hopefully soon will be the sixth leading cause of death. So we, I think we're doing well, but not as well as we would like to. Now, we live in the stroke belt, and I'll show you a picture here. And I say always that the stroke belt is the losing side of the civil war, look at this. There you go. The dark portions that you see, all of these dark areas that you see right there, that's the stroke belt. Now if you go to Nevada, you see there is no strokes in many parts of Nevada, mostly because elk, if they have strokes, we don't know about that. And deer, there's lots of elk, deer, and wolf. So I used to say that in Nevada and people thought it was funny, but I think it's funny too. But so you see, this is the stroke belt. And uh, you have heard about the Sun Belt, right? The Sun Belt is the southern, southwestern United States. We have the Corn Belt uh, in the Midwest right here. This is the Corn Belt, the Rust Belt right here. Uh, we call this the Unchurch Belt. Maybe some people have heard about that. And this is the Bible Belt, and it's also the Stroke Belt. Um, anyway, um, we have many risk factors here in the South. One of them is ethnicity. People uh, from uh, black, as and they have more strokes than other people. Not only that, but the strokes are more severe in the black population. We also have other risk factors, like you can read them right there. And uh, we have so many chronic diseases in the South. Now look at, uh, look at those people in the Western states. I think that in many ways they are more health-minded than we are here in the South. And uh, probably they have something to do with the, the way we eat and there, there is uh, more obesity and high blood pressure and other conditions here in the south. We don't know exactly what exact, we don't know exactly the reason for why we have more strokes in the south and why strokes is more severe in the south, but the point is that uh, that's, that's what it is and there is, uh, there is many reasons we think, but we are not for certain. So uh, let's talk about TIAs. Maybe some people have heard about TIAs. TIAs mean that you have the symptoms of a stroke, you get maybe speech impairment, maybe you get weakness on one side or the other, maybe you have um, a loss of vision on one side of your visual field, either right or, or left, maybe you cannot walk, but then the symptoms go away within a few minutes. So that's what we call a TIA. And a TIA is not a mini stroke, but it's a warning that a stroke may happen so TIAs are serious conditions, and if somebody has a TIA, so if somebody has those transient symptoms, difficulty with speech, for instance, uh, weakness on one side, it could be the face, it could be the arm, difficulty understanding, or difficulty walking, then that's a warning. And that means stroke may happen very soon, and people should take this seriously. This is not a minor, trivial issue, it's a serious issue. Now, usually TIAs, they, la they last one hour or less. Usually TIAs last for 15 minutes, the symptoms go away. But I encourage uh, people to call 911. Don't go by yourself to the emergency room, but rather call 911 and be brought by ambulance. Um, it is better to come by ambulance to the emergency room than driving yourself for many reasons that I will tell you, hopefully in a, in a few minutes. Now, we have several risk factors for stroke. I decided that although, the, although Nichelle asked me to talk about acute stroke, but I should talk about some uh, risk factors. We divide them, the risk factors, uh, between non-modifiable and then modifiable because, uh, so as the name implies, non-modifiable means there is nothing we can do about that. So we have age. Strokes are more common after the age of 50, but there is nothing we can do about getting old, right? The only, the only alternative 
of getting all this to die young, right? So the alternative is not that good. Um, it, it, but we cannot, we cannot do anything about that. And then gender is another risk factor that we cannot modify because uh, strokes are more common in males before the age of 50. And then after the age of 50, strokes are equally common in males and females. And again, there is nothing we can do about changing our genders. Uh, you have heard in the news people try to change their genders, but that's only on the outside, right? And the inside we are who we are. And then I mentioned earlier ethnic background. So black individuals and individuals, certain Hispanics, Hispanics like me, certain people like me are, uh, are more likely to have strokes. But we cannot change who our ancestors are. So it is what it is. And then family history, because if we have a relative, first degree relative, who has had a stroke or a heart attack at young age, meaning below the age of 50, then that makes us more likely to have a stroke or a heart attack. But by the time they have their stroke or heart attack, they already had us, and then there's nothing we can do. I, I tell people that I would like to change who my family is. I would, I would choose rich and good-looking parents. <laughs> and then uh, I would be set, right? I wouldn't have to work, maybe. Uh, but again, we cannot change who our family is. It is what it is. And then our medical history, uh, like prior events, right? Something that happens, happened to us before. So if we already had a TIA, let's say, last week, that will make us more likely to have a stroke this week. If we had a stroke before, a couple of months ago, that will make us more likely to have a stroke this month and so forth. So there are things that happened to us in our past that will, in some ways, dictate our future. But there is nothing we can do about our past. I, I tried that before. You cannot change your past. <laughs> and um, and uh, so we don't try. I, I tell you that it doesn't work. So, so, but we cannot do anything about that. And then uh, you can see here from this slide that childhood cancer survivors are more likely to have a stroke when they become adults. And then if you have an infection, so for instance, if you have a severe infection in your lungs or an infection anywhere, that will make you more likely to have a stroke in the future. But it has to be a severe infection. If you have, to, if you have a little runny nose, probably that doesn't count. But I'm talking about severe infections. But again, nothing you can do about your past. And then we have some modifiable risk factors. Now, if you look at this list, if you look at this list, most of these modifiable risk factors depend on your lifestyle. So high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, and so forth. That's basically lifestyle. If you change your diet, if you lose weight, if you exercise regularly, and if you choose to eat the right foods, then your blood pressure may get better on its own. You don't have to take medications. I mean, some people have to take medications no matter what, I'm certain. But some people may get rid of their medications for, for blood pressure if they lose weight, exercise regularly. And same thing can be said about diabetes. So if you lose weight and you eat the proper meals, it is possible that you can control this risk factor. And high cholesterol, same thing. So as you can see here, all of, many of these risk factors can be modified by your choosing. It's your lifestyle. Certain types of heart disease you cannot change. That's, that's who you are, but, but other things you can change. And then everything that I said is right here, right? I mean, and then we, you can use medications to modify your risk factor. So if you already had a stroke or, or a heart attack, you can use some of these medications that you see here, list them on the right side. But mostly, some of these uh, risk factors can be changed, modifying your, your life, making changes in who you are. Now, let's go back to the acute stroke. The, the, the important word about strokes is the name, the, the word sudden. Strokes don't happen over days. You, can, you, you wouldn't say, doctor, I've been having a stroke over the last couple of weeks. That's silly. It, it doesn't happen like that. Strokes happen suddenly. So if I were going to have a stroke right now, I'm just talking to you. Uh, and then suddenly, I cannot say my words. I would slur my, my words. I can become numb. And I could uh, have difficulty with my speech, for instance. I cannot see. I, can, I cannot move properly. I become weak. I cannot walk. It happens suddenly. So since I started saying this sudden, until now, it has been maybe 45 seconds, 160 seconds, and it, strokes happen that fast. They, you're fine, and then you're not, just like that. So if you have had symptoms lasting for a couple of weeks, three weeks, 
then, as we say here in Alabama, that ain't no stroke, right? <laughs> Strokes happen suddenly. And then uh, somewhere in, in, uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, they came up with this pre-hospital, uh, three different symptoms that we call f uh, FAST. F for face, A for arm, S for speech, and T for time, because it's time to call 911. So if you see someone having this, uh, facial weakness, uh, weakness in the arm, speech difficulties, and then uh, it's time to call 911. As I said before, it's important that you don't drive this individual to the emergency room yourself unless you're across the street. If you're across the street, yeah, just go across the street. But if you're not, then you should call 911 because if you call 911, the emergency room will be prepared to receive you as, you as soon as you come in. In many places, there are systems in place where <coughs> EMS will call the emergency room and, and say, listen, we're bringing a possible stroke patient. So ideally, the team will be ready for you in the emergency room awaiting your arrival and then things get done faster if you arrive by ambulance than if you walk in. So I would, I would advise if, if any of you sees their loved ones having these symptoms, then you should call 911. And then, um, so what do we do? Well, we have treatment for, for strokes. 25 years ago, in the early 90s, when I started my residency training in neurology here at USA, the treatment for stroke was to put the patient in a dark room and hope that they would get better on their own. That was the treatment. Sounds, sounds awful, because it was awful. There was nothing to do for these individuals. Nowadays, if the patient arrives within a certain frame of time, then there are things that we can do. And what we use is, uh, is called uh, TPA. Uh, the brand name is Alteplase. And Alteplase is a substance that we produce in our bodies. And uh, this company, they have found a way to produce large amounts of this, of this uh, uh, medication, and then they put it in a bottle, and then they sell it back to us. That's what they do. But we, we did a large study back in the mid-90s that proved that patients who, take, who get this medication IV within uh, three hours of onset of symptoms, they fare better than individuals where we don't do anything. So now the, the, the window has been extended from three hours to four and a half hours. So if someone has a stroke and they arrive in the emergency room within four and a half hours, and they have to meet certain criteria, we cannot just give IV Alteplase, IV TPA to just anyone, but if the individual meets certain requirements, then this patient can get, can get this medication and it can, it can change somebody's life. The medication is actually not great. It helps about 30% of patients. So the other 70% of patients still don't do, do, don't do that well. But still, if you treat 100 patients, if you treat 200 patients, then you have 30 or 60 patients that are now walking on their own as opposed to be in a hospital bed at home. So although the medication is not great, it's rather mediocre because only helps 30% of patients, still is better than nothing. So I would encourage people that uh, have those symptoms just to go to the emergency room just in case and don't delay. Now despite, despite that it works and despite that it's cost effective because this is one way that the government and society looks at diseases, right? How much is the cost? How much is costing this condition to, to society in general? So it's cheaper for society that I, I, I take care of myself, that I can feed myself, and I can get dressed on my own, and I, I'm still working. That's cheaper than being in a hospital bed and paying a nurse that will come and change my diaper every day and so forth. That's expensive. So if we look at that, and this is how so many people look at this type of things, it is very cost effective. This medication, it don't, don't, not only works in about 30% of patients, but it's very cost effective. Despite that, only 5% of stroke patients receive the medication. Why is that? Well, because many patients cannot get it because it's a blood thinner, very strong blood thinner, and if the patient is taking certain blood thinners, they cannot get it. If the patient had a surgery last week, if the patient had surgery, open her surgery last week, well, this patient cannot get IVTPA 
because of the risk of major bleeding. So you don't, I mean, one, one thing that physicians don't want to do, we don't want to hurt our patients. I know that, uh, well, this is a good time to make a little editorial. You know, we become physicians because, because we want to help people. No, nobody becomes a physician thinking, I'm going to be a doctor and then I'm going to hurt people. Nobody says that. We all want to do something good for society and help people. That's what we want to do. And uh, so if, we, if there is any contraindication such as, man, the patient is, just had major surgery a couple of weeks, a couple of days ago, then we cannot give this medication because of the risk that we're going to make the patient worse. Now sometimes, and this is the very common, patients wake up with the symptoms of a stroke. They went to bed the night before, they were fine. And this morning when they wake up, they, they find them unable to speak or they're weak, but they, don't, they may not say anything or they don't know about it or, or they may think, man, um, I have a numbness in my arm, I have weakness, maybe I slept the wrong way. I, I shouldn't have slept on the couch, I knew that. I should have slept in my bed instead of falling asleep watching Matlock reruns. <coughs> I don't know if they have Matlock reruns anymore, I'm just saying that. And, and then some people, of course, they don't call 911. And I said before, it's very important that people having symptoms of a stroke, they should call 911. Now, sometimes in, in some tiny hospitals, usually rural hospitals, the emergency room physician uh, is reluctant to use this medication because the medication is risky. I mean, it's a very strong blood thinner. And you may imagine uh, patients may bleed, I mean, because it's a blood thinner. And they may, may think, I mean, I don't want to do this. I, I don't know, I'd, I'd rather send the patient to USA. But by the time they call USA and there is, the ambulance comes and picks up the patient and they come all the way over here, then it's too late. And that short window, four and a half hours, is over. And then there is nothing to do for this patient. Sometimes that happens. I don't think it happens so commonly in Alabama because we have hospitals all over the place, right? I mean, there is here, then across the bay there are hospitals. And if you go farther east, there is Pensacola. Now, if you go west, of course, there is Biloxi. There are hospitals everywhere. If you go north, I think you're on your own. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, well, there is Admore, right? There is Admore and Baby Net, and there, there are places along Highway I-65. I Don't take Highway 45, because then, then you're on your own. But if you go in a major highway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know. I'm, I don't know if I'm saying it's true. I'm just saying that. But, but certainly, sometimes they don't have a neurologist. I can tell you that there is not a neurologist in Atmore or Babynet. I can tell you that. There is not another neurologist between here and Montgomery. So, so that's... But you know what? In Nevada, there are hundreds of miles where there is nothing. So there are tiny mining towns. You go on the highway in some places in Nevada and you see the name such and such, whatever town, town population, 300 people. And you said, really, 300 people? And you go by and you don't see anybody. And you said, really, 300 people, where are they? You know, sounds like one of those horror movies, those thrillers, <laughs> and, and I never stopped. So I never got to find out. And so all of these reasons make it sometimes difficult for patients to get this medication. And, uh, and um, so it's very important. The, the most important thing is to call 911. Now, I, I was telling you about this fast, right? Remember? Uh, face weakness, arm weakness, speech difficulty. They appear in, the slide says right here, 88% of all patients who have a strokes and TIAs. So strokes usually, number one, they're sudden. They don't happen over days or weeks. They happen suddenly. And the other thing that you have to take, keep in mind is that strokes um, affect one side of the body. So if you have dizziness, then I don't know what that means, right? Dizziness could mean one million things. Uh, but dizziness normally is not a symptom of stroke. You have a headache. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want to say that it's not a symptom of stroke because it could be. But it's not common that a headache or dizziness are symptoms of stroke. This, what you see here, is what is common. One-sided symptoms. Strokes very rarely affect the whole body. Strokes normally affect one side or the other. And, and so remember that. You have an individual who has speech difficulty, facial weakness, arm weakness, then it's time to call 911. I, I cannot emphasize that long enough. Now, not always people who have those symptoms 
not always they have stroke. You can have a seizure and the symptoms may be similar to, uh, to a stroke, particularly after the seizure. Oftentimes individuals have a seizure and then after the seizure is over, they have weakness on one side of the body, they cannot speak, and if you just walk at that particular time, you don't know what's going on. You just see somebody on the floor, and you, they're weak on one side, they cannot speak, and you think they have a stroke. It is okay to call 911 and bring them to the emergency room. There is nothing wrong with that. Then there are patients who have migraines, and they can have the same symptoms. Uh, migraines are very common in the general population. About 14% of all people have migraines. So I don't know how many people are in here. I'm going to say 100. So 14 of you have migraines, but just by statistics, right? And oftentimes, migraines come with something that we call aura. And those individuals, they may have speech difficulty. They may have weakness. They may have numbness and tingling. And the first time around, the second time around, after this happens, this patient may think, I'm having a stroke. I have this terrible headache. I have this weakness on one side of my body. And I remember that guy a couple of months ago spoke about stroke symptoms. I'd rather go to the emergency room. Well, it is okay to come to the emergency room. It's better to be safe. It's better to be seen. And then it, it wasn't a stroke, it was a migraine. And now you know, as opposed to not doing anything and then waking up one day after and you're already paralyzed and there's nothing you can do about that. Because once, once uh, you have a stroke and you don't do anything, then there is nothing to do. Uh, the best treatment for a stroke is not to have one, right? But if you have one, then remember to, to call them one one. And then some patients who have diabetes, they can have low blood sugar. And uh, you guys know that uh, in, in patients who have diabetes, although the blood sugar is high by definition, oftentimes the blood sugar is low. If that happens, many patients may present with symptoms similar to stroke symptoms. Sort of speech, one-sided weakness, so that can happen too. And then brain tumors. Brain tumors usually appear on one side of the body or the other. It's uncommon that a tumor is on both sides of the brain at the same time. I guess it can happen, but it's not common. More commonly, tumors are on one side of the brain and then if they're on one side of the brain, the patient may have similar symptoms. Multiple sclerosis is not that common of a disease, but of course, being a neurologist, I mean, I've been exposed to patients with multiple sclerosis and we have, so this is another time, I'm gonna take a little break and do a commercial. We have hired a multiple sclerosis specialist at USA and he starts the 1st of August. So next, in a couple of weeks, I think his last name is Kilgo, Dr. Kilgo. And uh, he has specific training in multiple sclerosis and I hear that he's very nice. I'm not, I'm not really sure, I haven't heard anything, I'm just saying that. <laughs> I'm sure he's a nice guy. I, actually, I met him a couple of months ago and he seems like a nice person. So, uh, but multiple sclerosis oftentimes can present with similar symptoms, uh, at, at least the first time, as if the patient has stroke. And then there are other conditions. So I just want you to, to know that there are, there are multiple conditions out there that could present as if the patient is having a stroke. And that doesn't mean that I, I don't want you to become complacent and, and think, oh, it's only a headache, I probably shouldn't do anything. Well, if you have had headaches with aura over the last 15 years, then you know your body, you know this is not a stroke, but if this is the first time around, I would encourage you to call 911 and say, listen, I think I'm having a stroke, I'm having these symptoms, or if you see your loved one unable to speak, and you see your loved one having one-sided weakness, I would encourage you to call 911 and do something about it. And then, so other than that IV medication that I was telling you about that we can use within four and a half hours after the onset of symptoms, so well, one thing that the stroke neurologist, if I'm in the emergency room and you come to, when I'm on call, I'm gonna ask, when was the last time that this individual was seen normal? Because that will be the onset of symptoms for me, right? If you say, uh, well, I'm just looking at that wall and it says 11, it says 12.25, and I say, you know, he was fine at 12.25, it is now uh, 2 p.m. And I said, okay, so we are within that window. And I know the onset of symptoms was at 12.25. There were multiple 
witnesses and they all said the same thing. And then I can use, if other things check out, I can use this IV TPA, this IV medication that can help the patient. Now, when somebody comes to the emergency room with these symptoms, the first thing that we need to do is to get a CAT scan to make sure the patient didn't have a bleeding in the brain. Because if the patient has a bleeding in the brain, clearly we're not going to use this blood thinner, right? This is a different type of stroke. Um, and then we're not going to use this blood thinner. So that's the first thing we need to do, make sure that the patient didn't have a blood thinner, I'm sorry, a, a, a bleeding in the brain. And then we say, we look at our different criteria and we say, okay, this checks, this checks, this checks, okay, this patient is going to get IV TPA. And then oftentimes, depending on the case, we ask the patient or the relative, listen, it seems like your loved one is having stroke. We have this medication that we can use. We have to use it immediately because we have a short window, a very narrow window in time. And if we miss this window, then there is nothing else we can do. But so we have to hurry because the evidence shows that the sooner you start the medication, the better the outcome is. So if you wait, if you wait around trying to make up your mind, you're wasting precious seconds. Every minute that you wait, millions of brain cells die because of lack of blood flow. And I, I mean, I would like to say that it's okay. We have lots of brain cells and we can, we can get rid of some of them and nothing will happen. But uh, that's not true necessarily, right? I mean, I would like to keep all my brain cells as long as possible. So I, I wouldn't say, well, we have four and a half hours. You know what, let's go, let's get some coffee and then come back. That, 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 that wouldn't be the right thing to do. The, this is an emergency and we need to treat it as, as such. So the emergency room physician is going to say, listen, we need to hurry up. What do you want to do? Would you like to get the medication or not? Because the patient may decline to get the medication. And I have had multiple patients over my 20 years of practicing neurology where the patient told me, I don't want to get the medication. Because when you, when you tell the patient, uh, it seems you're having stroke and we have this medication that we can give you, but the main side effect is bleeding because this is a blood thinner. And on occasion, the bleeding can be serious. So you can get this medication and you, can, you have a chance of bleeding, but if you get it, then you have 30% chances of being fine to the point that you can move on with your life. Now, if you don't get the medication, there is some likelihood that the stroke will get worse and then you will be bedridden or unable to speak or, or maybe you will have to walk the rest of your life with a, in a wheelchair, you get around in a wheelchair. So this is the, the thing that the patient has to decide at the time. And many patients have told me, I don't want, this, is, sounds too, this sounds too risky, I don't want to get it. The medication is risky, but, uh, but it's safe enough that we use it. I'm gonna tell you if I have a stroke, I want to get that medication. I don't want, I don't want the doctor to put, to put me in a dark room and hope I get better on my own. I rather, I rather get the medication, and if I bleed, then so be it. But at least I try to get better, as opposed to being complacent and don't don't do anything. There is a saying: complacency kills. So, so now not only we have the medication, but when we get the CAT scan, we have a way of knowing whether there is a large clot inside the blood vessel. So in this in this cartoon right here, you see this blood vessel and then you see the clot. Sometimes there is a large clot sitting inside the blood vessel obstructing the blood flow from the heart into the distal portions of the brain. So nowadays we have this device, as you can see, we call these stents and, and this is a mesh that you see right there and then um, we have two stroke neurologists at USA I'm one of them and the other one is Dr. Cordina. Dr. Cordina has special training in performing these procedures. So if, if the individual, we can see on CAT scan that they have a large clot sitting inside the blood vessel, then he can put a catheter through the groin and push the catheter all the way to the artery that is blocked. And then he can deploy the catheter and then grab the clot and pull it out. And so this is amazing, right? Before, you can imagine 25 years ago, we didn't do anything for this patient, but they just put him in that dark room and that's it. But nowadays, not only we have this IV medication that we can give within four and a half hours of onset of symptoms, but now we have these catheters 
that, that people can use. And the catheter can, has a longer window. It's not four and a half hours. Most of the evidence indicates that catheters are good up to six hours. So if the patient had a stroke at 12 and they show up in the emergency room at 5 p.m., then still there is no time anymore to give IVTPA. That's too late. But still the patient can get this procedure and, and hopefully Dr. Cordina can go in, grab the clot and pull it out. And uh, there is even newer evidence uh, to say that even even after six hours, some patients, depending on other criteria, but some patients can get the, the clot pulled out 12, even 24 hours after the onset of symptoms. So this is very good news. It, does, isn't, it doesn't apply for every single patient, but certainly applies for some patients that before there was nothing that we can do. So this is another picture. This is nicer than this one, right? I think this is nicer, but you see the catheter right there. And then um, you see how the mesh grabs the clot and then pulls it out and then clears the artery and the blood flow restores. Now, um, not everybody gets better, of course. If many hours have gone by, depending on other conditions, it may, the procedure may not work. But certainly, at least if you call 911 and you come to our institution, and there are other institutions, of course, we're not the only one. Uh, but if you come to a large institution like ours, then there is a chance that you may get better as opposed to staying at home thinking, oh, I shouldn't have slept on the couch. I'm just going to wait until tomorrow to see what happens. Then tomorrow is going to be too late. And I think that's the last thing I have to say about acute strokes. And we have a few more minutes where I can, I can tell you, I can answer questions or if you want to hear about my private life. <laughs> But if you have any questions about acute strokes or risk factors, anything that comes to your mind, then we can address these questions over the next couple of minutes. I have. Yes, ma'am. Okay, the TPA, that's, it's risky because it's a blood thinner. Correct. Well, if you don't have any symptoms of, I mean, you don't take any other blood thinners or anything, why would it be risky? I mean, a lot of people take blood thinners to make them better, so. So the question is, I hope everybody heard, the question is if IV TPA, so the question is why is it so risky, right? Right. Because right. it's a very strong blood thinner. Okay. And what happens when somebody has stroke, the blood vessels are damaged too. So let me go back one. So the blood vessel, that the clot, where the clot is sitting, let's say that, uh, I, I think this is it. So let's say, let's say the clot is, was right there. So not only the brain tissue suffers from lack of blood flow and lack of oxygen, but the blood vessel gets damaged too. Because the blood vessel gets its nourishment from the blood itself. So when the blood vessel gets damaged and then suddenly you restore the blood flow, then there is a likelihood that the blood vessel would leak blood. And that happens not normally uh, within the first four and a half hours, but after that, it's more likely to happen. And likewise, uh, if I get IVTPA right now, if for whatever reason that nobody would understand, I'd say, yeah, just give me some IVTPA. Go ahead and hook me in. It's, it's unlikely that anything bad will happen to me because normal brains, and I'm assuming that my brain is normal, right? But normal brains don't bleed. But if I have a stroke and the blood, vessel, the blood vessel right there is damaged after the clot, right? The clot is sitting right there, but the, this blood vessel is damaged, then it is, re, it is more likely for that blood vessel to leak. It's like an old pipe in your house, like one of those houses in Midtown. I didn't want to buy a house in Midtown because they said the pipes are old. I don't know if that's true or not, but true. <laughs> it's true, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so those, those pipes leak because they're old. And the blood vessel may not be old, but it's damaged. So, and that's what is risky. And, the, and bleeding happens in about 6% of patients who get IV TPA. Um, even with, with that risk though, when you see those patients um, three months after, patients who bled, patients who got IV TPA didn't bleed, patients who didn't get IV TPA, overall, patients who, who get IV TPA, they have a better outcome 
that patients who didn't get ITPA, or even patients who got IVTPA and bled, they still do better than patients who didn't get anything. So, so that's why we recommend, I mean, I would, rec I would recommend it to my own relative and to my loved ones, and as I said, uh, to myself, if I, I should maybe have a tattoo on my forehead, give me IVTPA. <laughs> Have you heard about people who have a tattoo, do not resuscitate? Yeah. Well, I want to say, I want to have one that say, give me a VTPA. <laughs> but it's just a short term. You don't continuously. Absolutely. The IVTPA, the half-life, the amount of time that it stays in the body is about one and a half hours. And after that, it's eliminated and the risk of bleeding subsides. Okay, good. It's not like you're going to have risk of bleeding the rest of your life. Okay. But there are certain medications that if you are taking before, and then we find out, and then we say, well, you can, I cannot give you a VTPA because the risk of bleeding is large. And remember what I said, right? We don't want to hurt anybody. I mean, we want to help people. So I wouldn't give you a medication that I'm thinking, what if I harm her? Then I wouldn't do that to you. But, um, but there are other blood thinners that you can take and we still can give you a VTPA. So part of the process includes asking questions about what medications you take and so forth. So that's, yes, ma'am. Yes. I have a family, my mother and two of my brothers died of a stroke. Yes. And I have not. <laughs> I'll be like this. <laughs> so, uh, so, so your question is, you have two relatives who died of strokes. What is your brother? And your question is? Two of my brothers. What's yes, your, your brothers. That was my, my question. But they, they all smoked and I did not smoke. So okay. And I'm still good. You're still in good shape. Yeah. So uh, maybe you, you are wondering what is your risk of a stroke, right? Yeah. You're wondering, I have two close first degree relatives who died of strokes. Yeah. They were males yeah. and they smoked. Yeah. So what are my chances? Well, I cannot give you a number, but I can tell you this. Well, let me first ask you, at what age did they have their strokes? Yeah. My mother was about in the 50s. 50s. And my brothers were in about 50s. 50s. Under 60s. Under 60s. So they were relatively young, right? Yeah. Um, but they were over the age of 40. So. So the, the epidemiological studies show that <coughs> only in individuals who have strokes at young age, mm -hmm. this is an important factor. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not that old either. They, I mean, they were not 80 or 90. Right. You had to die of something, right? right. But, but they were not that old and they, they were not that young. So maybe there is a risk there for you. And they also smoked and they were males. Yeah. So you're not a male and you don't smoke. Do you smoke? I'm German. No, no, she I'm doesn't. Smoke. <laughs> I'm German. <but> I <laughs> you don't smoke. No, don't smoke. You chew. And she exercises. She exercises. Yeah, exercises. So your chances are, I mean, you have a risk factor because of your age. I'm assuming that you're over 50. <laughs> I am 79. Okay, I didn't want to say because, you know, it's not polite to. But, but, but uh, so you have a risk factor because of your age. And then you have a risk factor because of your family history. And that's, I mean, I don't want to spill your guts, spill, you know, tell me your whole life, what but... What do I do? What do I do? Well, you should, you should... Do you you should exercise yeah, regularly. so you exercise regularly, right? Yeah. The American Heart Association recommends between 30 and 40 minutes of exercise where your heart rate increases, <laughs> right. um, four or more days per week. And you do. Oh, yeah, so, I do. Okay, you do that. And then you should stay away from cigarette smoke, oh, I right? Don't, I don't like cigarettes. You don't like cigarettes. <laughs> Meditation. <laughs> and then you should eat healthy, right? So you should eat veggies, right? Fruits, vegetables, grains, yep. seeds. Yep. You, sh you should stay away from the cane flesh. Right. You stay away from the cane flesh. What? Meat. She, she eats very little. She eats very little to me. I'm her daughter. I'm sorry. I'm kind of taking. So, uh, so there is evidence that oily fish like salmon, tuna, halibut, that type of fish they can be beneficial for you. Mm -hmm. But, um, but other, other flesh is not good for you, like red meat. Yeah. I mean, if you want to have steak yeah. for Christmas, I I, I'm just saying, <laughs> if you want to have steak, Turkey. yeah, probably nothing is going to happen. But if you eat meat every day, that probably ain't good for you. Uh, there is something in the protein of meat that has been shown to be damaging and, and produce a risk of a stroke. So I think you're doing everything right. I do. And uh, I don't think that you need to do anything differently. Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get into more details, but, but I think that you're, you're okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know you probably want to, I'm 
this is very quick. Very quick. I take you a said. daily baby aspirin. Is uh -huh. it better to take it in the evening, like I do? Why do you take an aspirin for? For the same reasons. I. But I you haven't had a heart attack or a stroke. No. Then you shouldn't take a baby aspirin every day. Really? Yeah, really. But what if you're experiencing similar from what you're talking about the symptoms? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I feel that. A lot. I'm more of a high strung person, but I exercise a lot. Tracy, you know that. Well, you shouldn't take an aspirin. And remember that, no, yeah, you shouldn't. That's interesting because I always assumed it was a good idea. Yeah. Everything that sounds like a good idea is not. <laughs> okay, but if you want to like if you are feeling that way, you know, like something's not right, right. would it be better in the mornings or in the evenings, in your opinion, like as a neurologist? Does it? it I don't think it matters. Okay. As we say, it don't matter. But, uh, but let me say this. If you have a TIA, mm -hmm. stroke will happen very soon after. Yes. That I've never had. Right. So, well, but you said you did. No, no. I've never had that. I, I have had, that feeling. I have experienced, I'm a flight attendant for Delta, and I have had passengers have them quite. Oh, I see. Seen passengers. Enough, seen enough oh. That it puts that little. Yeah, thing. yeah. And I fly international. I think those trips sometimes set off things. Yeah. So if you see a, 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 a passenger yes. in your flight having stroke symptoms, you shouldn't give him an aspirin. Okay, that's good to know. Because what if they have a bleeding? Right. Then you're going to make him worse. Correct. Okay. Um, but then, um, but people who don't have TIAs or strokes or heart attacks, they shouldn't take an aspirin. So if you already had a heart attack, if you had a stroke, mm -hmm. if you had a TIA, you should take aspirin for prevention. But remember what I said, if you have a TIA, you're likely to have a stroke. That's a warning symptom Correct. that you're about to have a stroke. Right. So if you don't have a stroke within the first few months or weeks or months, then it's unlikely that you will have a stroke later. It's the, the risk decreases as time goes by. So after a TIA, you have a high risk of having a stroke. That's what I said earlier, that TIAs are not, are not trivial. Conditions. This is serious. Very serious. This is freaking right. serious, right? So you get a TIA, and if you are evaluated and the physician decides that that you need to take an aspirin, then you take it. But you shouldn't just take an aspirin. Okay. No, I'm glad. Yeah. I just assumed that that was a good idea no. for all, all of us to do, and I learned something. You else. said, "Hold my beer," and then start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't even know what I'm just kidding. No, no, but it's good to know that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Tell us a little more about TIAs, what they are, what causes them. So the same, the same risk factors for TIA apply to strokes. It's the same thing, except that the clot dissolves on its own. Sometimes that happens. Remember that I said earlier that we have TPA in our bodies, we produce it. So our own TPA sometimes dissolves the clot on its own. Who knows how many tiny blood clots we have on a daily basis? What if you take an international flight on Delta <laughs> and, you're <laughs> and you're just sitting there for hours and hours in those tiny seats yeah. and, right. and they don't like even want to give you a glass of water? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just speaking with you. <laughs> I'm just what kidding. He's <laughs> so who knows, right? But those clots go away. They, they just melt on their own. And then you have the symptoms and then you didn't have a stroke. The symptoms went away within minutes, but you felt terrible for a few minutes, so that's a TIA. So it's the same thing exactly. So it could be also that the blood vessel gets narrow for whatever reason. It, cannot, it not necessarily has to be a clot. It could be that the blood vessel gets narrow. We call that spasm. Then the, I'm just saying that, right? The blood vessel gets narrow, and then within a few minutes, the blood vessel uh, resumes its normal diameter and then the blood flow restores itself and then you didn't have a stroke. Also, it could be that your blood pressure drops or goes very high for whatever reason and then you have the symptoms or your blood sugar drops. It could be one million reasons. But, but again, um, are usually the same mechanisms. If you have a TIA, that means you're at risk of having a stroke. It's like when people go to the emergency room because they have chest pains and then they get there, they get the EKG, they get the blood work, and the emergency room doctor tells them, you didn't have a heart attack, but you're at risk. It's exactly the same thing. To the point that some people call strokes brain attacks. Some people call them that way. The, the term never caught up, but a few years ago, people were calling them brain attacks. It doesn't sound fancy, so nobody. Yes, sir. 
<clears throat> the numbers that you get from your blood pressure readings. Yes, sir. Is that is there ever a point that that would tell you you need to go to, to the, the emergency room? Uh, well, I'm not a blood pressure specialist, but I'm going to tell you that nor the normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, and then the American Heart Association came up with new numbers. And they still say 120 over 80 is your blood pressure. It should be. If it is higher than that, then you need to make lifestyle modifications. That if that doesn't work, then you need to take medications. And I cannot tell you how high apple pressure needs to be for you to panic. But if you have high blood pressure, then I would recommend that you check your blood pressure every morning, or maybe not every morning, it gets old, right? I mean, who has the time for that? But, but then before you even get out of bed, you should check your blood pressure. And then you know your numbers, and if you see an important, whatever you think it is important, then you should call somebody, you should call your doctor. Uh, I'm going to tell you that for most people, if the blood pressure is 180 over 95, then I would call 911. Again, don't drive yourself to the emergency room. The only way, the only reason to drive yourself to the emergency room is if you have had a call for the last three weeks. Then, yeah, drive yourself to the emergency room. Don't call 911 for that. As a matter of fact, don't go to the emergency room for that. But, but if you have new things happening, like high blood pressure all of a sudden, then, yeah, you should call 911. We have a few more minutes if you want okay. to ask more questions. Yes? I was concerned because somebody said they take one baby aspirin. I've been taking two for years, every day. Yeah. Have you had a heart attack or a stroke or a TIA or...? then you shouldn't. There is no evidence that taking a baby aspirin prevents the first stroke ever. We have evidence in the literature, plenty of evidence, that taking an aspirin after a first stroke can prevent the second stroke. But we haven't ever seen that it prevents the first stroke ever. So that's not a good... I wouldn't do it. I, yeah, I don't take a baby aspirin. Well, if you take a baby aspirin, the dose is too small to help you with any soreness. I mean, back in the day where we didn't have so many medications for pain, people used to take aspirin 500 milligrams four times a day, so two grams daily. That was in the 80s, in the 70s, even before probably. But now we have so many pain medications around that, and I'm telling you, 81 milligrams, that's a baby aspirin. So two baby aspirins, 162 milligrams. That ain't going to do anything for your soreness. Now, if you take it and you believe that your soreness go away, then take it, right? I mean, if it makes you feel better, who can argue with success? But if you're taking it for a stroke prevention, it ain't going to work. It doesn't work for heart attack prevention. No, no. I mean, there is, there is, a, there is a table that uh, I have in my laptop computer somewhere. And then it tells you, if you are of the age of this, if you are a male, if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, and you have this, 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 and then it gives you a percentage of chances that you may have a heart attack in the next year. But, but then you have to have so many conditions, so many risk factors, and then sometimes the primary care doctor may decide that that could be something that you may want to do. But if you're female and you don't have high blood pressure, you don't smoke, you don't drink and you don't chase wild men, all of those <laughs> bad things, right? <laughs> and then if you, if you don't do any of that, then, you then you're not, I mean, you shouldn't. Yeah. You shouldn't. No, no, I'm yeah. I mean, if, if you ha already had a heart attack, if you have what people call angina, so you have chest pains. When I work out, I feel here. Like yeah. yeah. But that, that's not angina, angina is pain. Yeah, so maybe that's what it is, but so if you don't have, if, so remember that aspirin for primary stroke prevention doesn't work that well, but for secondary stroke prevention, once you have one, you want to avoid the second one, sure. then it may, it may help. In regards to her original question, yes. morning or night, my dad had to do it, but he had all of that, diabetes, yeah. he had a TIA and high blood pressure, all that high cholesterol, and so Dr. Coates had put him on a uh, uh, baby aspirin and he said to take it at night and I believe his reasoning was because he's more sedentary and, you know you're laying down in bed all night and it just helps the blood flow yeah, yeah it doesn't matter because but aspirin uh, the effect of aspirin lasts for 72 hours mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter where you take it okay. and that's that's science right yeah. okay. any yes 
I'm not going to go through this lane, <laughs> but I can. <laughs> um, with the IV meds, would you ever do it and the stent? Yes. The well, well not, not at the same time. Maybe not at the same time. But yes. So there is some evidence that shows, and this is controversial, because these stents are kind of new. We started doing these stents back in the 80s, and just they didn't work out. But now we have new technology. Because before, we, ha we used some stents that look like a, uh, 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 one of those uh, screws that you use to uh, uncork wine. Yeah. What do you call those? Uh, cork screws. Cork screws, yeah. And that, that didn't work. And then over the, over the next few years, we used another one that, that was like a, like a straw. We would put tiny amounts of TPA in the cloth, melt it, and then suck it out with the, with the so I'm saying straw. And that didn't work out uh, very well either. But this new generation of stents, they work better than the previous generations. And, and so multiple studies over the last three years have shown that they work better than the previous ones, right? And so the controversy now is, do we use IVTPA and then the stent? or just the stent alone, and the coin still in the air. The jury's still out. Some people say, let's bypass IVTPA, let's don't waste time on that medication that I said earlier is kind of mediocre, only helps about 30% of patients. Let's go straight to, to the stent. But some people say, no, wait, we have here evidence, we treat this many patients, and if we use IVTPA and then the stent, then the outcomes are much better. So the, what we do here at USA, we use IVTPA and then we use the stents. I think the majority of the stroke places do that. Now the, the clot has to be a certain size to use the stent? Yes, uh, it has to be of a certain size that we can see it on CAT scan. If we see that the cat, in CAT scan that the blood vessels are clear, then clearly there is no stent to retrieve. I mean, if there is no clot, then you're, you're going to put the catheter for no good reason. We have to see the clot. And the larger the clot, the less likely IVTPA is going to work. But we still use it because that's the center of care. And as I said before, although this subject is controversial, but the evidence at this point seems to indicate that, the, that both things, IV alteplase followed by the stent immediately after, leads to better outcomes. So uh, if you have a large clot, yeah, that's what I would recommend. One last question. Yes. In the slide earlier, it said that children we don't know why this is these are studies that are done by epidemiologists and they just see so we have this 500 patients with strokes so we're going to ask them hey listen did you have cancer when you were a kid and so they go back in history but we don't know why it's one of those mysteries we have so many mysteries you know sometimes physicians we act like we have all the answers we don't know anything. Well, we know, we know a little something. But we don't know as much as we sometimes pretend. So we don't know the answer to that. Yes? Uh, the medicine, if I understand you right, is good up to four and a half hours. Yes. Now, if I understand strokes, basically uh, it's a loss of blood flow to your brain, and it starts killing your brain cells. It kills your brain cells. Right. So how come? The medicine is only good for up to four and a half hours, but the, the stunt, it's good up to 12 hours. Doesn't that give more time for the brain cells to kill? Or Yes. Oh, plenty of time. Yeah. Brain, ce brain cells are, are puny. Three, three minutes, four minutes, and you start losing them. Mm -hmm. It's just that quick. But the, the thing is that the IV TPA, the risk of bleeding increases the longer you wait to give it. And oftentimes, there is tissue, brain tissue. When you have a stroke, there's tissue that is dead and does that. I mean, by the time, you can imagine, you have a stroke here. Let's say that I have a stroke right now. By the time you call 911, I hope you will call 911. Would you call 911? <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> by the time somebody comes and they take me to the USA Medical Center, well, it's going to be, what, an hour, 45 minutes? So many of my brain cells are gone and does that. But there are so many brain cells that are suffering from lack of blood flow but you can, you can still save them. They're not, comp they're not dead, <coughs> but they're suffering from lack of blood flow. So those brain cells, they get tiny amounts of blood flow. The blood flow is not completely blocked to that tiny amount. So there is the core of the stroke, 
And then there is the area surrounding the stroke that is still viable, still can be saved. And TPA cannot do anything uh, because the risk of bleeding is too, much, too high and you will kill those patients, so we don't want to do it. But if you remove the clot, then the blood flow restores. This, the core is, is dead, that has been dead since yesterday. But the area that is surrounding that area that is dead still can be saved, and that's what you do with, this, with these treatments. That's what you save. That's why is, it is useful several hours after TPA is not useful anymore. That's the reason. That's an excellent question. That's very critical thinking. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. People who can get to the hospital in time to get this treatment, do they end up paralyzed on one side or the other? Or well, not necessarily, right? That's what we're trying to do. If you make it on time, then you can save that brain tissue, and then the patient comes to be functional and walk again and, you know, move on with their lives. Oftentimes, the medication doesn't work and patients are paralyzed, but many times, patients get much better. I have seen patients that I see them in the emergency room and they're doing terrible. And then we give them medication and a week later they're walk, walking out of the hospital. Which as, whereas before, many of these patients, they will never walk out of the hospital. They go in a, in a uh, stretcher to the nursing home or something. The are just terrible. They're terrible, yes ma'am, they're terrible. We have come a long ways, but it's still a long ways to go. And um, I'm just, I'm being just privileged to help so many patients. And I hope People to... People just realizing something's wrong and not doing something about it is... Yeah, that's what is important, that people get educated, right? You have symptoms of stroke, you need to call 911 right away. I, you had a question? Or you did have a question? Dr. Lopez, I yes. realize this is a, I'm giving you a segue to your next lecture for us. But okay. can you say a little bit about the acute aspects of a stroke that turns out to be a basal ganglionic lacoon. So that's another type of a stroke, right? So strokes are, can be different types depending on the caliber of the blood vessel that is affected and depending on the mechanism. So we have large vessel strokes like this picture. This is a large vessel. It's not just large in the picture. It's supposed to be large in real life, right? Um, and then we use this type of procedures. And then we have strokes that are produced by a clot that leaves the heart and travels downstream. And the clot may be tiny, or there may be multiple tiny clots, and they just shower the brain with tiny clots. That's another mechanism. And then the lacoons that you're talking about, this is a different mechanism altogether, and these procedures don't work on lacunar strokes. Lacunar strokes are produced by progressive narrowing of blood vessels over years. This takes decades. This doesn't happen suddenly like this. Well, the symptoms happen suddenly, but the process underlying the stroke happens over decades. Usually people who smoke, have diabetes, high, high cholesterol, or high heart rate pressure, their blood vessels, tiny ones, they get narrow and narrower as time goes by until one day they're completely closed, and then you have a stroke. And the symptoms are, again, of sudden onset, but the mechanism of stroke is different, and these procedures don't work because the blood vessels are too small. So uh, nevertheless, we still use IVTPA in these patients. If, if, you, if you present to the emergency room with new onset symptoms, then we're going to treat you with IVTPA, provided that you give consent. And sometimes I have treated patients without consent. Um, somebody is found or somebody brings somebody and they say, listen, this lady was over there at uh, Taco Bell, I'm just saying, so she collapsed. And, uh, and we, we saw her, she collapsed, and she was by herself. We called 911, and then the EMS, they say, upon arrival to the emergency room, yeah, the time of phone said was uh, 1 o'clock. I mean, that's what the witnesses say. And we talked to the patient, and she cannot give us consent. Then I use IVTPA, because I'm assuming, we, we make many assumptions in medicine. We're assuming that the patient would like this medication. And, and, and we, we use a concept in medical ethics that, that, we, that we assume that the patient wants what is best for them. So if the patient cannot give consent, we still do it. That's interesting. Yeah, there, there is a, I mean, uh, certain things we wouldn't do, but if it is not an emergency, we're not going to say, listen, we're going to amputate your leg. Yes. 
no, something like that. But yeah. but in these emergency circumstances, because we don't have time right. and we cannot contact the relative, we just do what we think is best for the patient. So lacunar strokes are treated the same way. Yes, sir. It's one o'clock, and uh, I think we're running out of time. And I have. Uh,